The English language is spoken by over 450 million people around the globe, with a further billion using it as a second language. English is, arguably, our most famous export. The man we often credit with shaping English is the great playwright William Shakespeare. His iconic lines still resonate today. Is this a dagger which I see? As Shakespeare's plays hit the London stage four centuries ago, England began building an empire. Now, soldiers, march away! An empire that would spread Shakespeare's English around the world. But is the real story more complex than this triumphant tale? Shakespeare, did he invent thousands of the words we use today. No. <laughs> 300, possibly 400, maximum. What really inspired Shakespeare's English? There is this notion that Tudor England was this merry place where people used to eat chicken legs. And actually, England has been sort of multicultural for many years. Comment vous appeler, Monsieur Lefer. In this film, I'm going to uncover the real story behind Shakespeare's English. Take thou thy pound of flesh, but in the cutting of it, it is <laughs> How a small island tongue grew into a global language. To be. Or not to be. As a historian of language, I believe words reveal as much about our past as the great events of history. When I first came from Ireland to study at Cambridge a decade ago, it was to explore British history. And one period in particular fascinated me. The fabled reign of Elizabeth I. Elizabethan England is sometimes described as a golden age, the start of an empire. But I think there's more to the story. At the start of Elizabeth's reign, England was not a powerhouse. In fact, it was a bit of a backwater with an insular language to match. In the 16th century, English was far from being the global language it is today. One Anglo-Italian translator, John Florio, wrote that English was a language that will do you good in England, but past Dover, it's worth nothing. If you had stopped an Elizabethan in the streets and told them their language was going to become the most powerful one in the world, they would have laughed in your face. For Elizabeth, the outer reach of her mighty empire was Ireland. In the 16th century, the furthest afield you were likely to hear English spoken was my home city, Dublin. Even in the rest of Ireland, English was at best a minority language. Surrounded by Irish speakers, even the old English settlers were using Irish. The Queen was encouraged to learn a few words herself. This is a primer. It's a manuscript that teaches the Irish language and was given as a gift to Elizabeth I. It shows Irish words next to English and Latin translations, giving Elizabeth a handy guide to the Irish tongue. I grew up speaking Irish as well as English, so I'm able to pick out some of these words. Three of them are clustered together in a way that I think is fascinating. Changa, lingua, tongue, re, rex, king, rian, regina, queen. And there's a sense in this Irish primer that language and power, language and conquest, language and control always go together. If language is power, England didn't have much. The rest of the primer reads like a phrase book for tourists. Here on this page, the reader learns to say some basic phrases you'll still learn if you learn Irish today. Conosototu, how do you? Tom gama, I am well. Although if you're learning Irish today, you probably don't learn how to say, God save the Queen of England. Elizabeth had limited authority in a country supposedly under her control. But this reflected a broader problem.
England was isolated. Henry VIII had split with the Catholic Church during the Reformation, driving a wedge between England and the continent's Catholic powers. The English language was even further adrift. The Reformation was a crisis in English identity. What did it mean to be English in a newly divided Europe? Some scholars thought that the answer lay in their language. They wanted to compete with French or Italian, but first it had to be reformed. One man tackling the job was a Cambridge scholar named John Cheek. He set out to translate the New Testament in a way that he hoped might solve a problem with the English language. In the early 16th century, there was a feeling that English as a language didn't have a sufficient richness of vocabulary. So the usual way of remedying this was to, to look to, to Latin or to French and, and bring in foreign loan words and turn them uh, into English ones. But John Cheek wasn't interested in the usual remedies. Cheek believed in purifying the English language. He wanted an English that was unmixed, in his own words, unmixed and unmangled with borrowings from other tongues. And he wanted to drag it back to more kind of Anglo-Saxon roots where possible, because he was worried that if you have lots of Latinisms in the language, it's going to become incomprehensible to, to the ordinary people. As a reformer, Cheek wanted a Bible written in a truly English English. Not a simple task. This is a work in progress. This is a draft where you can kind of watch Cheek thinking it out. He's written one thing and then he's changed his mind uh, about some of the translations to ensure it's accurate, to ensure it's clear. It's not always easy to read. Woe be to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you go about both by sea and land to make one freshman, and that being done, you make him thrice as much an hell imp as yourselves. OK, I have questions. <laughs> um, uh, a freshman? What's going on there? That's, um, in the King James Bible, that's translated as proselyte, so someone who's been converted from one faith to another. So. You can see why he's done that, but it's not an immediately comprehensible concept. Or hell imp, it's a, a child of hell, imp being a, an older word that's still current in this period for child that now has a rather different meaning to us. And that's all one word there, that's H-E-L-I-M-P, hell imp, uh, which I feel is due a revival. <laughs> <laughs> but John Cheek faced a problem. He didn't have enough words. So. Cheek is trying to write an English that doesn't borrow these kind of Latin terms. How possible is that actually going to be for him? How successful can he be with a project like this? Well, even his own language, he, it isn't totally stripped. It is not left unmixed and unmangled <laughs> uh, um, of borrowings from foreign tongues. He's using words like providence or precedence or error. These are all words with you know, Latinate roots. So even his own language uh, has to be accommodating and absorbing these fairly well-established but not totally long-established words. But when we reach the end, um, he finishes the Gospel of Matthew. He starts the Gospel of Mark um, and it seems to be going well. Uh, and then, yeah it doesn't really get past page two. <laughs> um, he seems even to have stopped mid-sentence here. Uh, it says, uh, and I went after him, and they came into Capernaum, and... Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. So, John Cheek never finished his purified translation of the Bible, partly for lack of Anglo-Saxon words. But Cheek's idea of an unmixed and unmangled English faced another challenge. The Reformation had kicked off a migrant crisis around Europe. Protestant refugees flooded into English cities from Italy, the Netherlands, France. Suddenly, their languages buzzed on the streets of Norwich, Southampton, and of course, London. For writers like William Shakespeare, the atmosphere was electric, and 
everything came together at the theatre. If we'd stood in the yard of his Globe Theatre, uh, what kind of an audience might we have encountered? Um, well, you would have encountered pretty much everyone in London. It was the the, the thing to do. We also have accounts of, of play going in the period from travellers from Europe. We have German travellers and Italian travellers, a Swiss. Uh, and so, yes, there were people in, in the playhouses who were from all sorts of backgrounds. So even then it was a tourist attraction. It was mass entertainment. I lose this labor. Standing right here, it would have cost a penny. So if you were of the uh, working classes, uh, working in the different trades and guilds, you would have come in and they would have stood all around here. And in those days, they would fit 3,000 people in here. So yeah. it was like a mosh pit in the yard, actually. <laughs> <laughs> not um, comfortable. Not comfortable. So this would have been an international city and an international area in Shakespeare's time. Absolutely. I mean, I think history has taught us the opposite in many ways. Uh, we sort of washed out the fact that um, England has, and London in particular, has been sort of multicultural for many years. The presence of lots of different communities here uh, was something to celebrate. People sometimes talk about a Shakespeare myth, about this figure who's been kind of built up uh, in various different ways. If there was one plank of that myth or one element of it that you could knock out and, and throw away, which would it be? I think it would be this idea of um, this sort of genius in this attic in Stratford-upon-Avon with a puffy shirt and a quill. But actually, Shakespeare was here. How oh, it did grieve Macbeth. He was working with actors, he was walking around dirty city streets. In such a night, Troilus, methinks, mounted the... I think there is this notion that Tudor England was this merry place where people used to eat chicken legs or turkey <laughs> legs. And, and actually, it was a much more complicated time um, and definitely not uh, homogenous in any way. Foreign languages filled the streets. But immigrant communities also brought something more their culture and literature. I'm fascinated by how they transformed the English language, and by one man in particular, John Florio. Ciao, buonasera, come stai? Bene. Allora, bene, grazie. Eh, un caffè macchiato, per favore, e un bicchiere d'acqua. Grazie. John Florio was a second-generation immigrant from Italy. As a translator, he saw himself as bringing European culture and literature to the English masses and there was plenty of work to do. In Italy and France, a renaissance had been transforming art and literature. But in England, it had struggled to put down roots. Some 16th century thinkers worried that England was falling behind. Thank you. People like John Florio were determined to change that. They made it their mission to bring continental ideas and language to England. At Oxford is a book showing the difficulties immigrants faced in Elizabethan England. This is a book John Florio wrote in 1591 uh, to teach English speakers how to speak Italian. But what grabs me is the way that Florio speaks about himself. He writes, As for me, for it is I, and I am an Englishman in Italian. I know they have a knife at command to cut my throat. Un inglese italianato e un diavolo incarnato. An Englishman Italianate is a devil incarnate. Now, who the devil taught thee so much Italian? Florio has a sense that Italian is a language that's prestigious, that people want to learn, they want to learn about Italian culture and literature. But there's a tension there, there's worries and fear and hatred towards Catholic Italy. It's a time when you can read Italian poetry at court and play the Italian lute but you might also risk being beaten up in the street for speaking the language. John Florio let nothing stand in his way. He was a teacher, a translator, he wrote dictionaries, he was even a private secretary to Queen Anne and a key influence on William Shakespeare. And what's more, he made continental books, ideas and language available to English readers for the very first time. John Florio is someone I really admire, and we've come to Magdalen College here in Oxford uh, because Florio has a connection with the college, but also because the library holds uh, a fantastic collection of his books. 
Well, here we've got his Italian English dictionary dedicated to Queen Anne. He gives us a list at the beginning of the book of the names of the authors and books that have been read. And you can see it's a very extensive and very varied and wide ranging list. So we see here classic authors like Dante and Boccaccio, but next to them he's also reading manuals about artillery uh, or about horsemanship. He's reading erotic literature, he's reading comedies, he's reading modern books, 16th century books about good behaviour and bad behaviour. It's really an incredibly broad range of inputs and an incredibly capacious idea of what the Italian language was. Florio's dictionary contains many of the Italian words we still use in English today. So here we've got the word gazette, which he defines as running reports, daily news, idle intelligence and flim-flam tales. Uh, <laughs> and he refers specifically to kinds of um, news sheets that were being um, produced in Rome and Venice at the time. And of course, this is the origin of our English word gazette. Here's the word capriccio, um, a sudden toy, a fantastical humour. Uh, also, a sudden fear, making one's hair to stand up on end. It's a lovely word because it comes from the Italian word riccio, a hedgehog, so literally uh, hedgehog hair. Um, and it was first adopted into English, it appears in Shakespeare, in this form capriccio, but then subsequently the influence of French meant that we had the French version of the word caprice, uh, which survives into modern English. So it shows us a kind of the, the gradual um, assimilation of an Italian loanword into English. Along with other immigrants, John Florio had made Italian language, history and culture accessible to the English. And it's easy to spot their influence. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Shakespeare's plays are packed with references to Italy. We know he read John Florio. He even quotes one of his Italian proverbs, word for word. Venezia, Venezia, chi non ti vedi non ti prezzi. Translators like Florio provided something every writer needs. We few, we happy few. New content. Band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. So we know that Shakespeare borrowed stories from other cultures to use as raw materials for his plays. But did he also borrow their language? As a writer, Shakespeare loved new and novel words. It's often said that he coined them himself, a master wordsmith. But when his language is examined using 21st century technology, scholars are starting to reveal a different story. Jonathan, you're a linguist. How does a linguist go about unpicking Shakespeare's language? I'm a particular kind of linguist. Uh, I'm a corpus linguist. And so we take a corpus, which is a large, if you like, data bank of, of language, lots of texts in electronic form, so we can search through them with a computer, and we look for patterns. I always think of it as like aerial photography, that when you're on the ground, there are things you can't see. I'm able to spot patterns that a lifetime of reading, you probably wouldn't see them by using a computer to show me what is getting repeated in certain contexts. Someone says to me, well, this word is coined by Shakespeare. I can type it in and look at all the works around Shakespeare, all the printed works, and get a sense of, well, is there actually an earlier work where it appears? Uh, and that, that I can do uh, within seconds. Then I spoke the right. Corpus Linguistics is changing how we see Shakespeare's English. His heart is fractured and corroborate. Shakespeare, did he invent thousands of the words we use today? Short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly longer answer? Do you want the longer answer? <laughs> the longer answer, well, I mean, lots of people think that he did. The truth is certainly far different from the, the grandiose claims that people make that he invented half the words and the English a quarter of the words and all this sort of thing. But I've been looking at um, what the reality actually is. 
Uh, and the way it's heading uh, at the moment, we're, I'd say it's around 300, possibly 400 maximum. Probably less, but that would be the maximum. But if Shakespeare didn't coin all those words, where did they come from? The question is, uh, is he the first person to record something he heard on the streets? I'll, I'll give you an example of one where I suspect he heard it. Hobnail. Uh, it seems to me a bit unlikely that Shakespeare was coining that one. He probably heard it, used it, uh, but it was around, you know, so it's the first recording. Jonathan, can we see the influence of other languages on Shakespeare's works? I have done the deed. The one I've been working on quite a bit is Incarnadine, which uh, occurs in the line multitudinous seas incarnadine in Macbeth. Now, this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine. It, it comes from carnis in, in its Latin, it would be f uh, flesh, meat. And so it's literally, I suppose, to make fleshy, but actually at that point it was used to mean redden, with blood red, fleshy blood red. So the multitudinous seas make them fleshy blood red. Rather the multitudinous seas in Carnaline. <laughs> did he coin it? No. It's actually a Latin word. But what he did is he verbed it. He turned it into a verb. Um, it had been used as an adjective one or two years before, but he clearly worked in that slot um, and he thought, well, I'm going to put it in there to, meet, to mean me to make red. And it works really well there because it goes along the line, makes it rhythmic. The multitudinous seas in Carnaline. <laughs> but Shakespeare had an even closer connection to foreign languages. He lived in an immigrant community. For 10 years, he'd been uh, effectively a lodger or renting a room with the Mountjoys, who were a French family, Huguenot refugees, Protestants from France. And so he was, you know, cheek by jowl with French immigrants. So he would have heard French around him. Ask me this slave in French. What is his name? Écoutez, comment vous appelez? He was hearing this stuff and you would, you would expect, perhaps, that he would adopt some of these French forms. Monsieur Lefer. He says his name is Master Fur. Merci, monsieur. So we don't need to have the idea of Shakespeare as the sole word-coining genius of English to still have an appreciation. Let's say he coined 200, 100 words. That's way more than other, other writers. That's simply amazing. If it were 10 words, that would be amazing. Um, so let's not pump it up to the point where it's absurd and let's recognise uh, what Shakespeare is doing. Uh, he is a wonderful word coiner, but also a wonderful word user. He can use them to great effect. Even, uh, hey, someone else has used, used the word, but no problem. He takes it and puts it in a new con context and makes it work for him. Shakespeare's wordsmithing flourished, but not through his own solitary genius. In the space of 150 years, thousands of words and phrases were imported from French, Latin or Italian, transforming the English language. John Cheek's mission to purify his mother tongue of these borrowed words seemed a million miles away. Instead, Writers thrived using a newly expanded vocabulary. Borrowed words had become a vital part of English. At Oxford is one of the most influential books in the history of the English language. Dr. Samuel Johnson's dictionary laid the foundation for modern usage. But in the 18th century, Dr. Johnson faced a dilemma. What to include and what to leave out. He began working on it in 1747 and quickly ran into difficulties. Rather ambitiously, Johnson thought he could do it in three years. Um, so when he sets out in uh, 1747 in his plan of the dictionary, he thinks that that's how long it will take him. Um, in fact, it takes him eight, and, um, but even that is a pretty impressive undertaking. The dictionary contains over 40,000 words, including those Johnson disliked. Shabby, he says, a word that has crept into conversations and low writing but ought not to be admitted 
into the language. <laughs> but of course, we still use it today. So it shows that you know, John Johnson had strong opinions, um, but they don't necessarily have any effect on the later history of the language. In spite of his prejudices, Johnson includes borrowed words. French, of course, is the big influence on English in the 18th century, and Johnson's dictionary reflects that. He recognises that a language must borrow new terminology, and if it comes from the donor language, then so be it. For instance, um, there's a nice example, um, the word souvenance, which is clearly marked out as a French loan word at this time. Uh, it means remembrance or memory, and Johnson says, a French word which, with many more, is now happily disused. <laughs> uh, you might wonder why he includes a word <laughs> if it's no longer in use, and that is a curious feature of his definitions. Earlier authors like John Cheek were aiming to strip out you know, Latin words or other foreign words from English. Uh, Johnson seems to be doing something different, even through gritted teeth. He is casting the net much more widely uh, for words uh, that English has accepted from other languages. The experience of writing a dictionary led him to recognise the folly of what he calls enchaining syllables and lashing the wind. It just can't be done, he recognised. But while Johnson accepts foreign words, he sometimes struggles to give credit to their real origins. Does Johnson's dictionary help to found some of the myths uh, underlying modern English? The sources that he draws upon are not really current and contemporary examples of English, like we might think of a sort of modern desk dictionary. It's, a, it's contemporary English in usage. He had a different idea about what should be the, the, the sources, and they're very much... English literature of the past 200 years, the, the greats, the, the wells of English undefiled, as he describes them. Um, and the literary model, of course, is very much founded upon Shakespeare. And Johnson's dictionary remains the dictionary of English for 150 years. It's, it's replaced subsequently by the New English Dictionary, or what later became the Oxford English Dictionary. But that, in a sense, begins where Johnson left off, with uh, mining the works of Shakespeare and other great literary writers, Chaucer, Milton, Dryden, and so on, establishing this idea of a literary uh, origin for English. For centuries to come, these English writers, and Shakespeare in particular, were given credit for the rise of the English language. The lady doesn't test this Shakespeare myth grew and grew, when really, Shakespeare's Renaissance was rooted in a multicultural England. Gentlemen in England now eventually shall think themselves accursed they were not here. Inspired by immigrants, by John Florio and other translators, Asians, courage, fortitude, I am and ready. echoing the languages he overheard in a multilingual London, Venezia, Venezia, the foreign Venezia. words that John Cheek was so wary of actually created the vibrant and global language we speak today. To be or not to be, that is the question. Modern English emerged not from literature or dictionaries or academies, but from people. The French, the Dutch, the Italians, all these people brought their languages and blended them with English. And in the end, it's this migration, this mingling, that really makes English, English.